Welcome, folks, to the next of our webinar series. This is Learning from Stories of Change, Monitoring, Evaluating, and Learning from Social Change with Eric Smith and Catherine Irving, who are part of the Cody International Institute. And I'll hand it over to Eric and Catherine. Good morning. I'm Eric Smith, the Manager of Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning at uh, the Cody Institute. And I'm Catherine Irving, normally in the Marine Michael Library, but I also help out with monitoring, evaluation, and learning. My, my interest being in the learning. So today we'll be speaking about the Learning from Stories of Change study, uh, which is now an almost five-year study that's been going on on our graduate outcomes. We'll also talk a little bit about future directions at the Cody Institute. Uh, before we begin, I just want to give credit to uh, the former manager of NEL at Cody, Molly Denheyer, who was really the architect of this project and who brought uh, Catherine and I uh, on board um, to, to help out with this. Um, so we're going to have three, uh, well, we're going to talk about the learning from stories of change. Um, as I said, it was a four-year, almost five-year study. And the final report was, uh, was published in December of 2017, and that report was based on 434 graduate surveys and 376 stories of change. But we're continuing to collect these, uh, these surveys and now have over 600 survey responses and over 500 stories uh, from graduates over the last uh, almost five years. And our webinar will be in about three parts. Uh, Catherine will introduce the challenge, the theory of adult ed, transformative learning, and methodology. I'll then talk about the results um, found in the report and what this means for transformative learning. We'll then open it up briefly for, for questions, um, for a Q&A on the learning from stories of change, before going into the final section where we'll talk about a few of the, in, the new initiatives or directions uh, for Cody's MEL, including uh, social network analysis and feminist monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Um, so it will be a more traditional presentation, but do feel free to uh, chime in, raise your hand, speak out if you have a question or a uh, comment. So with that, I'll pass it over to Catherine. Okay, so the challenge. Um, has been that uh, with monitoring and evaluation is something that we're always we always do and have to do and but we want uh, Molly as Eric said you know really wanted to do something beyond what our standard monitoring and evaluation practices have been and so the challenge that we put before us was to capture Cody's longer term outcomes um, because we do have to generate you know Positive, uh, demonstrate how positive social change um, you know, happens with our graduates and demonstrating those effects beyond individual learning. So we're going much further beyond course evaluations and standard tracer surveys. And also, because it is who we are, wanting to use a participatory adult education approach and also, we didn't have the budget to go and talk to everybody, so how do we reach a geographical, really diverse network within budget? And um, I rather, you know, half-jokingly added that E word. For those of us who are not really embedded in monitoring and evaluation, it can often seem kind of a little confusing, a little technocratic, and maybe even a little scary. So, you know, that this this is an opportunity to see what the power of good information is to help in our learning. And this, as we know, is just a little snapshot of what our Cody education programs look like. And so it is, you know, short term, long term, it could be pretty complicated trying to, to sort out all of these different groups and programs. So it was developing a system that would you know, encompass the range of programs we offer. And so Molly brought me on board just because she was interested in bringing, strengthening that adult education approach. So I, you know, our theoretical framing is looking at transformative learning 
from our history of being informed by that Ferrarian approach of transformative learning as you know, learning for social change and people's empowerment and community empowerment. Um, I asked Marjorie Mayo, who has done a lot of work on education for social change, and I said, how do we evaluate this? And she said, well, yeah, that's a hard part, you know, that, that it really hasn't been looked at very thoroughly. So we saw this as our point to, to really explore this further. And evaluation normally within the field of adult education really has waned. When I started working here years ago, it was you know a, a core aspect of adult education. And as evaluation grew in its own right, we kind of left it all behind. And as I mentioned earlier about the stereotypes and suspicions of evaluation, you know, kind of addressing that um, because the results, you know, it hasn't always been a happy time where what's being measured isn't what people value and you know so it's great to have evaluators and educators talking together to to figure out this out um, so this has been our goal is this re-engagement between these two fields and of course back to our participatory approach uh, Patricia Cranton who used to work uh, at St. Abex years ago this reminds us of that evaluation of emancipatory learning must involve the learners. So um, Molly look, brought in a number of methodologies, uh, use of stories, use of reflective space, participatory analysis, that participants are involved in the analysis, so it's not just using them to gather the information, but it's involving them in the, in the learning. And um, So, and then looking back at what does transformative learning mean and breaking it down into subcategories of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and motivations. So, understanding the concepts, learning and using practical tools, so knowledge and skills, fairly standard in evaluation. But where the shift is, is through those changes in worldview and most importantly, the confidence to drive to enact change. And so we're looking at where does that change, that action happen within personal, community, organization, and policy levels. Um, in, from the evaluation world, or in the HRD sector, um, business, uh, Kirkpatrick model has been there for decades. And so it's one that often gets used because it is so well known like some of the adult ed models, it's there, so you make use of it. Um, so they have four models, reaction, what do people think of it, learning, what did they actually learn, behavior change, what did they do with it, and the results, what, hap you know, what happened as a result of their change. Um, it's been heavily critiqued because it's simple, but it's used because it's simple, and um, so we were kind of aware of the critiques involved in addressing it. Um, sure. Okay. So uh, with the learning from stories of change methodology, we really wanted to capture the breadth across programs and people as well as the depth of change, where they're applying it, how they're applying it, at what level it is. Um, meet multiple demands for monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning. So satisfy numerous different donors um, who all have M&E requirements. Uh, also make it useful for Cody's own organizational learning and then be able to give back to, to the field of research and uh, contribute to the literature. We also wanted to facilitate reflection and participation across all of our alumni who are spread throughout 61 countries. So that necessitated some thinking about you know, how can we do this using technology rather than doing it face to face. And we were inspired by the most significant change technique uh, as well as SenseMaker, which is a very expensive program that allow that uses dyads and triads to allow survey respondents to kind of choose where on a spectrum they are. So we, we modified that and we used SurveyMonkey Monkey initially and designed the 
questions carefully so that uh, so that there could be some self analysis by the respondents in there. Um, so step A were outcome surveys six to eight months post graduation, uh, where we ask respondents to report on key indicators, share a story of change, code their self code their own story, um, and then tell us about the significance of that story. Then. Step B was uh, secondary coding by ourselves in atlas.ti for types of learning, characteristics, and results of the chain stories, as well as Cody's contribution and potential challenges that, uh, that, our, that our alumni had faced. And then the last step were six focus group discussions for participants, as well as a data party with staff to, to facilitate a deeper participatory analysis of the story of change. And we did three online focus group discussions, followed by three in-country focus group discussions. So here's our data set from 2013 to 2017. Um, and this is just to give an idea of the response rates. Uh, and you'll see that the Diploma in Development Leadership has the highest response rate. It's also the longest on-campus program. And as you go towards the bottom, those become shorter programs. Um, and then off-campus programs. So, I mean, even for the off-campus programs, 56% is a really respectable response rate for a, for a graduate survey of this type, especially a fairly long graduate survey. So we're really happy with that, and you know, our, our inclination is that this really uh, reflects the connection that our graduates have to Cody and their commitment. So these are our key indicators. Uh, Please, sorry about the wonky image, it didn't quite convert into Blackboard Collaborates. Um, but this is basically what keeps our donors very happy. Um, our participants reported that they, that they gained knowledge at 97% said yes, um, applied at 86% yes, and then about, I think, 10% uh, somewhat. And then shared, 80% shared their new knowledge and skills six to eight months post-graduation. And then about 15% 15 um, percent said somewhat to that question as well. There was, um, there was some variation between genders, but not much in terms of raw rates. But we'll talk a little bit about the differences between the genders later. So here's a relationship between the questions and the responses. When we talked about what skills they gained, they talked about knowledge and skills. When we talked about how they applied, they typically spoke about knowledge and skills. And we had to ask about sharing. How did they share um, their Cody education? Again, they talked about knowledge and skills. But when we asked people to tell us a story, they talked about the attitudes and motivations. When we asked them about the significance of that story, they really spoke to the attitudes and motivations. So it was the story-based methodology that got to that critical element of adult education and transformative learning. Um, you know, this is also one of the more sustainable uh, parts of, of development uh, work. You know, attitudes and motivations can be maintained, they can be sustained, and when like-minded people gather, that reinvigorates those attitudes and motivations. So, you know, even the methodology itself is trying to, to uh, invigorate that. Here are the, the self-coded areas of change. Um, we asked the respondents to list the areas of change, and this kind of shows that the well, individual was the most relevant, Organization was the second most relevant area of change, and community was the third most relevant area of change, followed by broader policy. Um, so it shows that kind of change begins with individual learning, and as behavior changes, the results um, kind of radiate outwards into different areas, and it eventually affects family, friends, community organizations, and the broader policy environment. These are also the areas of control or, or influence that, that our individual graduates have. You know, they can they have more influence over their organizations than their communities than the broader policy environment. This is similar to the previous slide, but it it's our own secondary analysis of the of the code. So the raw numbers are a little bit different, but uh, but quite similar. And the the thickness of the areas demonstrates the linkages. 
So uh, say from change in the individual leads to change in the organization is the, is the strongest linkage between areas of change. Um, change in the individual then leading to change in the community would be the second strongest. Um, So, you know, that, that just shows how the change occurs when graduates are applying their knowledge, skills, attitudes, and motivations. Um, what was interesting about this was that more men, 72%, than women, 57%, shared stories related to organizational change. And this is, uh, you know, as the literature attests to, women face additional barriers, access to power, perception of authorities, and societal expectations. So this creates a structural barrier or glass ceiling. And some of our recommendations were around how to, how to um, potentially boost or, or understand that. <clears throat> to engage participants and staff in what we were doing, we held three online focus group discussions around a selection of stories. Um, and then three in-country focus group discussions around a selection of stories, trying to respect geographical diversity in areas of Haiti, Nepal, and Uganda, while the online ones were, were global. Um, this was to validate the findings and get a little bit more in-depth in, in, in uh, the analysis and engage, in, engage our participants in some reflection. We also held a staff data party. Um, you can see some pictures of that up there. So here, again, it was for facilitators and staff to engage with the findings. Was there anything that surprised them? Anything that didn't? What does it mean for our recommendations? What does it mean for Cody? We used stories, video, charts, and graphs in a group discussion to you know, come to a, a shared understanding or at least uh, some, some, some common ideas around this. Do you have anything else to add on, on that section, Catherine? No. No? Okay. Um, so this is. So uh, what did we what what did we find in regards to transformative learning? Um, the first was that the learning space matters. In an inclusive learning environment, a mix of theory and practice, robust peer-to-peer -peer learning and flexible facilitation all play key roles in creating a learning environment that works for uh, our participants and works for adults. It also found that transformative education is a dynamic process with an interplay between knowledge, skills, attitudes, and motivations. So it's not one or the other, but it's kind of all of those as a process. Uh, with stops and starts and and tensions and challenges and that's and that uh, helps foster learning and then we also found that the transformative education process can be strengthened and extended in terms of advanced preparation and continuing support so things like mentorship and coaching online courses and or study groups webinars networks and information hubs fellowships blended learning opportunities and advanced programs and in our uh, these, some of these ideas have been incorporated into our programming already and others will be further incorporated moving forward. Um, one of the key findings is that our graduates are replicating and adapting transformative learning. They're replicating the adult education methods that they see modeled by facilitators in their own work having experienced the effect that the learning had on them. Um, it was also quite significant that attitudes and motivations um, to draw out each other's and their own insights as practitioners help strengthen their holistic approaches and up overcome challenges through things like recognizing and valuing, recognition and valuing critical thinking and awareness of broader implications and local issues commitment to greater collaboration, participatory approaches, and community-led processes, increased confidence in personal knowledge translating to greater participation, the recognition of responsibility to use their, recognition of responsibility to use their own abilities to make a contribution and advocate for change, and the value of adult education to draw out and build on the strengths within all people. 
Yeah, and I think I would just add that, you know, that was the, you know, the richness of the story. So earlier we saw the numbers of where these attitudes and motivations came out in the stories. But when you actually, you know, look at samples of them, you know, it comes up very clearly that, uh, you know, this is really, really useful information that would have been missed without that deeper layer of reflection by the participants themselves and their ongoing learning through this process. And, uh, and just, yeah, and some of the challenges, you know, that they continue to face, you know, would be they were quite, you know, honest in their, you know, responses like this works great, but you know, <laughs> we're still facing this challenge. So it's very, very useful in reading. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? Uh... So yeah, so just kind of leading on from that, um, that you know, that that participatory analysis of stories through the focus groups as well. Um, so you know, beyond the the sharing your own story, the, the results from the focus groups where people can engage with them and get into deeper discussions. Um, you know, where this this is another space for learning in the evaluation that it isn't just an you know an extractive process to get the information we need to keep our donors happy. It's you know a really interesting learning space for graduates to sit back and think about where they've been and you know what's how how their uh, their work is changing or the you know the issues that they're still facing and um, so you know i think it's really important for that to justify the value of a, this kind of methodology that it, you know it is a continuation of learning as well and i guess i'll yeah i'll continue that you know for, from my perspective as one that's not deeply involved in evaluation regularly that, that you know what really struck me was this process provided rich data that you know i've not seen in the past in, in, in all my years of cody that you know this is data that we wouldn't have captured with with the standard course evaluations and tracer surveys um but yeah overwhelming amount of time uh where uh, yes yeah, so the, the time frame is still short you know that this is you know shortly after graduation um, that, you know, some of those barriers, you know, people, they get back to their busy world, you know, they haven't had time yet. Um, so, you know, following up a few years after graduation, we'll probably see even more results or uh, you know, more interest, deeper analysis and stories and a shift beyond, you know, that organization and community and hopefully more at that policy level that you know, really makes donors happy. Um, but yeah, the challenge in replicating the method, it was a very intensive process, uh, a lot of work, and, you know, we're really fortunate to have this space to do that. Um, but I think, you know, it's, this is our role in, in documenting the process to demonstrate its value and recognizing when it's time to, you know, wrap it up and, and develop onto uh, new things. And just that the bulk of data that, you know, the value of having Atlas TI, which is, you know, a, a database for qualitative research, um, took a lot of work to set up, um, but now we can dip in and get, you know, a lot of information that would, you know, otherwise just be, you know, sitting in evaluation form somewhere. So, you know, having a way to extract the data is just as important as it is doing the evaluation itself. But here are a list of uh, some of the references from this section, um, just so that you have them available. And uh, let's open it up to some questions from, uh, from those who are in the webinar. Uh, now, those questions are, are more aligned towards graduates, so uh, please feel free to ask anything you'd like. And for those of you in Cody Connects who are listening to the recording, there, there is a discussion forum in our Cody graduate section that has specifically to do this so we can uh, engage in the conversation after the webinar. Paula, Joan, anything? 
So perhaps Eric and Catherine, if you could rephrase the question to us and uh, get us to you know, maybe even think about um, what, uh, what's resonating with us about your process of the stories of change findings and how it might resonate with us as practitioners as well. So I see a question from, from Joan in the, in the chat um, asking, how long did the survey take since it appears to be a new methodology? Uh, how much longer does it take? Um, so with uh, the survey software, we can actually time how long it takes participants to fill it out uh, compared to traditional methods. So in terms of participants filling out the survey, it's, it's no different than any other survey. I would say the typical response time would be between 10 and 20 minutes, but some uh, preferred to share more and others preferred to share less. So there were some extremes on either side, either side but the bell curve was probably between 10 and 20 minutes. Um, but if you're referring to, say, staff time in terms of analysis uh, compared to traditional methods, and that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, a standard standard graduate tracer study, you wouldn't do the level of analysis and coding that that we had done. Um, but it would I would be hard pressed. Suppose I wanted to run that in my own organization, for example. What do you think? I mean. I would say uh, there were probably probably two days of analysis uh, coding for every hundred hundred surveys, and we were doing uh, that coding twice a year. So there were probably four four days of coding every year, uh, and then on top of that, probably uh, several days of analysis on top of that. And then, of course, writing the report, it was a major report, so that took some time. And that depends on how in-depth you want to get with your analysis. So it, we could have done a much lighter touch approach to this and said, okay, we've got the information that we need, we've answered our key questions, but we really did want to dig deeper into it. So that was part of the, part of the reason that it was so intensive for Cody as an organization. Yeah, and I thought, you know, I think we, you know, when I was emphasizing the time, you know, I think in the initial setup of it was, you know, a lot of work, but it is, you know, producing results. So I think it's knowing there's going to be, you know, quite a bit of work up front, but, you know, once it's in place, then it, it makes, you know, as with anything, you know, we put the investment up front and then, um, you know, it, it works out well in the end. So I guess it's just entrusting that, and maybe yeah, what's how you do, how do you scale it for what it is you're looking for, and mm -hmm. we're just focusing on something you know, narrower, then it, it certainly reduces it quite a bit. So. Yeah. And so as as Wendy's just pointed out in the chat, fairly typical with qualitative data analysis, you can you can be light touch, or you can be you can you can get quite in depth if you'd like. It's Paula. Mm -hmm. um, just because I talk faster than I can. So I, it, this is really interesting to me because it's what I've been doing for decades, actually. Um, and it's it's interesting in terms of as someone who has spent the last 20 years as an adult educator, um, both in community and in, um, in the classroom at the Mount, their adult ed program or lifelong learning program. The thing that I learned fairly early on was that when you tell stories and get stories from, from your um, students that how much quicker knowledge gets transferred. You know, human, that's how humans learn best. And the interesting piece for me in all this is the actual um, framework, the evaluative framework that you did, the surveys and, and all that stuff. Because the, the rest of it, I think, is... is fascinating, but is it really news, I guess. Um, and I'm thinking in, in terms of the NOW program, and I'm wondering, is this something that you think could be adapted to a very small sample? Because, you know, like we have the, the 10 proponents, 
for instance, and, and a lot of the research we're concentrating on the stories piece, as you may or may not know. And I can certainly see a use for this to generate the evidence base for continuing this particular program for through policy. But I just be curious to know what your thoughts on that are. Is, well, you know, qualitative sampling tends to be very small anyway, um, comparatively speaking. But do you think that that would be that would translate okay? Mind if I take a crack at that one? Too? So yes, I would say that this is fairly new. Um, there's been a lot of work around stories-based methodologies, um, but one of the challenges there is that. Uh, is linking those stories to qual to quantitative data and hard numbers. So moving from the qualitative into the quantitative and being able to code those stories in a in a large and robust data set with a robust methodology. So it's you know making sure that you're hanging every story with numbers to convince those people who otherwise wouldn't be convinced by stories. They would dismiss them as anecdotes. Um, but of course, when you have a robust, robust uh, data set and and robust methodology, a whole bunch of anecdotes can turn into evidence. So I think that's what's that's what's new about this pro approach. Not that others haven't done it, but but perhaps they haven't done it in the adult education uh, context. Well, it strikes me though that this is very much like any ethnography to some extent, which, and if you're doing a discourse analysis, that's exactly what you're doing, or a content analysis, you're putting that quantitative piece into it. So it's then, and, and so what I find interesting in this is the survey component, because the the actual coding of the stories themselves, you know, like that, that's just a qualitative method. Mm -hmm. So, so to me, what's interesting here is the, is the survey piece. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced otherwise because maybe I'm misunderstanding. Um, well, I'll, I can chime in also. I think, yeah, it's the, it's the combination of things, um, you know, from a lot of the literature and trans, you know, within adult education, yes, you know, we're all convinced, of, you know, we use story in, in class and we use it in evaluation, but, you um, yeah, I think it is the mixture of the two of having those numbers. I think that was where it might be at a, in a smaller sample, it would still be stories and that would be, um, you know, oh, this is really nice, that's good, that's, you know, that feels good, or oh, that's an issue, I wonder what's going on there, that by having the sheer number, we were able to see patterns better. So like in, you know, where in just the survey alone, didn't see a strong gender, difference in what was going on in some aspects. In the story, you would see much stronger variation in gender uh, responses um, you know, when you really dig into the, to the codes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the going back and forth between the two that I found really helpful and being able to, you know, have some evidence to back up. Uh, you know, we, we sort of say, you know, kind of, self-deprecatingly kind of, you know, oh, our hunches or, you know, we know this works, but don't always have that, the, the data to back it up. And um, I know that this is a real challenge, particularly in, in fields of adult education that, you know, either profess or, you know, or are, in, you know, involved in that transformative learning work. You know, I've read lots of case studies where I thought, mm, yeah, this is a nice story, but, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm not so convinced about the, you know, the, the results from it. So that's what I, I found engaging in this. And and certainly many of the community development practitioners that I've spoken to have said that it is that that move from from the qualitative to the quantitative that you know they have quantitative numbers in terms of number reach, you know, knowledge gained, skills gained, etc. But, but to be able to then look at the stories and hang the quantitative numbers on that, they've said that that was not something that they'd seen before and they've been looking for a methodology that would, that would allow them to do that while using stories and get at what really counts in, in development. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps that's, yeah. Um, now, I, think, I, think I would say for the, for the NOW program, you know, given that it is a smaller number of, of uh, beneficiaries or, or what have you, you know, I don't 
think that the the kind of coding and the extent of the coding that we did would necessarily be would be would be necessary um, since it is only ten and and you know uh, some more traditional methods might work well. I think Catherine, you hit the nub of it for me um, with the, this using a mixed methods approach for transformative learning. Because you're right, in adult ed, people tend to either fall very heavily into the qualitative or the quantitative. I've always said that doing a mixed methods approach is the best way to get the big picture because you've got the quantitative that shows you the what, and you've got the qualitative that shows you the why. And it seems to me this is a brilliant example of, of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh -huh. Any other questions on this one? Um, oh, Joan, you mentioned coding. Could you say more about that for those of us who aren't familiar with that term slash practice? Um, <laughs> so coding would be would be reading a story. Um, I'll use the example of uh, knowledge, skills, attitudes, and motivations. So we have a definition for knowledge, we have a definition for skills, we have a de definition for attitudes, and we have a definition for motivation. And when you read that story, you highlight sentences or paragraphs that fit that definition. Um, so, you know, you get 100 stories, um, let's say 20% uh, are primarily about knowledge, 20% uh, are primarily about skills, 30% are primarily about attitudes, and 30% are primarily about motivations. Um, and you can draw some inferences from that, especially when you code a little bit more deeply and you can code between, between, um, between uh, uh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought, but that's kind of it in a nutshell. That's a fairly standard practice in, in qualitative, uh, qualitative analysis, and it could be grouping. Sometimes you would, you would take, say, um, 10 anecdotes, and you would, you would say three are about this subject and seven are about this subject. Uh, let's analyze those seven a little bit more deeply to see what else we can find by, by digging into those ones. And it also brings in, you know, what are uh, the other types of background research that we need to do before we embark on a project like this. So you know, doing a bit of a literature review, was it, you know, what is it I'm actually looking for, either you know, within our own documentation or our own, you know, reports to donors, what are those key words and concepts that we need to track? Um, when we get into adult education, the, the, Christina Holmes helped us a lot with uh, the setting up of the Atlas TI, and so she, you know, she was reading adult education literature too. Okay, what are some of those, you know, core concepts that, that we, you know, use? And so heading, setting up those definitions of knowing what to look for and then how to code appropriately. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the work that's done. Yeah. Essentially, it's looking for patterns. Yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, any other questions on the learning from stories of change? Going once, going twice. Okay, so uh, what's next for, for uh, Cody? I'm going to talk about two projects in particular. Um, <clears throat> social network analysis to understand the relationships between graduates and the collaboration that they're engaging in and then uh, taking a feminist lens to monitoring, evaluation, and learning. I'll start with uh, social network analysis. So uh, social networks aren't just Facebook or Twitter, but they're all social relationships, face-to-face, -face, by phone, email, etc. how people engage with one another. And it recognizes that individual leaders are important, but what about the capacity to spread individual action outwards and keep leadership nodes or leaders connected. Um, the creation and maintenance of positive social relationships is a critical element of the ABCD approach. Relationships are assets embedded within a social context. 
And social networks can bring together new people, bring together assets and resources, reduce duplication and efficiency, and help share ideas. Um, and the picture on the right is a social network analysis of the Mandela Washington Fellowship Regional Advisory Board members. And so the circles are individual people. Um, the size of the circles corresponds to the number of interaction that they have with others and the lines correspond to who they are connected to. So you can form these, these, these visual graphs of what a social network looks like, which helps you analyze it. Um, for some of these, these questions is what we would be using that network or that network map for. Uh, so the initial study will look at the Cody Alumni Network in South Africa. Uh, social networks and the individual actors we hope will generate knowledge and insight into how community development innovations can be translated into different contexts and into action. Uh, it also expands the MEL focus from individual learning and behavior to network effects on how ideas spread. Um, it will use quantitative data to visualize how graduates are connected or not. And we'll use qualitative data to understand why graduates connect with each other and what they share. So tools, approaches, job opportunities, new ideas, professional development, etc. Um, and one of the possibilities with this, uh, so the study has begun, the survey is out, and I'll be doing the analysis over the next several months. Uh, one of the opportunities for this is to expand the study to other countries or potentially cohorts of graduates. All those from 2016, for example, are all diploma graduates from 2016 to see if those, those linkages are strong or continue to be strong several years after their, after their program. Um, we also plan to share the methodology um, as a toolkit so that grads or others could replicate it, this in their countries or networks. Uh, and there's the potential to strengthen and support the, the graduate networks that Cody already has with this, or at least understand what makes them tick, what makes them work, or what challenges there are, what barriers there are to, to graduates connecting. Um, and then the other area that I'll touch on is taking a feminist lens to um, MEL. The Canadian government has adopted a feminist international assistance policy which targets gender equality and empowering women and girls. Um, so that's definitely one of the, one of the factors behind our consideration uh, for our, our, our exploration of this. Uh, but it's also becoming a more common approach in monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And I can point to some of the work that Oxfam Canada has done around this. Um, it's feminist Mel in general is not just about voices being represented, but creating space for uh, consciousness building, reflexivity, and capacity building not just for women and girls, but also for men and boys. And it's not a rigid set of tools or approaches, but a lens informed by certain principles. So it recognizes that gender inequalities lead to social injustice and that discrimination based on gender is structural and systematic. Male approaches themselves should challenge these inequalities and power structures and enable us to learn. It also challenges the perception that MELs are neutral. Um, but can instead themselves reinforce or counter power relations, um, both in the processes that they use, but also in the evidence that they generate. And the, some of the key principles here are that it's participatory, reflective, mixed methods, empowering for others and partners, and flexible. So actually quite similar to some of the principles that we used in the learning from stories of change approach, though we didn't necessarily call it feminist and we didn't, we didn't interrogate the data with an explicitly uh, explicitly feminist approach. And it's a learning partnership, not a performance test when you're dealing with, with partners. Um, of course, there are some challenges with this, such as the meaning of empowerment varies across partners, individual women and movements. And then there's also been some pushback against the label feminism or feminist you know, as a Western idea or imposition, especially when it's coming from, from a donor or from a partner organization. Um, so those are some of, the, some of the things that I'm thinking about 
and we'll be uh, I'm currently doing a literature review and we'll be able to share some kind of internal doc uh, internal um, internal documentation at Cody and um, and hopefully more widely within the coming months um, yeah, and I think also you know this is where you know our Cody graduates could can could really contribute to this uh, this layer as well, you know, the, especially with you know African feminisms and feminisms in South Asia that you know pushing back against that pushback about Western imposition. Is, you know, we have a lot of graduates in the Global Change Leaders programs that they deal with that issue within the course, and then well, what does that look like when they go back in their organizations and, and they're kind of you know strengthening uh, what does an indigenous feminism look like in there? context and also I just you know the, the highlight for me is you know challenging the perception of you know it's kind of what's the contribution to um, you know monitoring and evaluation to challenge that neutrality sense um, you know these are issues that we've been dealing with in adult education and social sciences uh, for years so you know it's coming into the to the monitoring and evaluation world as well it's, it's really encouraging I think mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oops, I have to click there for the next slide. So uh, I see Paula has posted a, a project that I will definitely be taking a look at um, on social network analysis about the about community-based AIDS organizations in Nova Scotia and how they learn. So I'll definitely take a look. And then another question, MEL means what again? So MEL, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Uh, to really emphasize the fact that it's not just about monitoring and evaluation for, for you know, donors uh, or for our donors, but instead it really should be about learning and that should be the emphasis on it. Yeah, and I think also how, how you know, learning among the participants who are engaged in the process and our own learning as well it just struck me uh, talking to some participants last year who you know were fairly open about oh yes we write all these reports we send it to a donor it ends up in a drawer or a hard drive and the organization doesn't you know engage with it it's you know phew we got a report off to our donor but what did we learn from it do we you know so being more attentive of how do we feed this information back in, how do we engage as a staff mm -hmm. um, to be involved in this process and, uh, and having, you know, different perspectives chime in and say, oh, what about this and what about that? And, you know, that's what I've, I've found really helpful for me is not being an MEL, ME expert, you know, but I would just kind of come in with the innocent question, just like you say, MEL means what again? Well, what does that mean? And so having the, those uh, people from our different, you know, our different perches kind of contributing has been you know, useful to me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think really emphasizing the learning. Well, one of the perceptions is that monitoring and evaluation is often a performance test, and and people are put off by it, they're wary, especially when it's someone who's outside, um, who claims impartiality and independence. Um, but but there's always a worry that, that it is a performance test. So it's shifting our own perceptions, and I'm speaking very broadly about here, my own, other staffs, in other organizations in the field in general, from, from MEL as a performance test over to it as a learning partnership where where we can all learn from it including continuously improving our own ME processes and um, and um, ways that we do things I'm just reminded I'm thinking back way back at when you know when I was a student in university we were kind of complaining about the course evaluation forms and got the pushback oh we can't change that because you know it would wreck our data we have to keep it exactly the same and that you know the you know the, 
you know, the rigidity of, okay, we're going to keep using a bad form because we've always used that bad form. It's just, you know, the, <laughs> it's, it's a much more refreshing time now. That how do we measure what we really want to measure? How are we doing this attentively and, uh, and usefully? Yeah. It's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Because what you measure counts and what's counted is valued. Or at least that's what you hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's both ensuring that you're collecting the right stuff and that it's actually actually useful to yeah. everyone. Yeah. Any uh, any further questions, comments, or reflections? Uh, happy to follow up um, in person on Cody Connects or uh, or via email. Okay, I'd like to take this opportunity to draw your attention to the link that was just posted in the chat. It is part of our monitoring and evaluation process of our webinars. Um, that is a survey we would ask you to participate in. It'll take approximately two, three, two to five minutes of your time. And our responses are anonymous and will be collated and analyzed and dated and encoded um, as part of our process for improving our webinar series and also connect collecting your feedback of what other webinars either you or some of the graduates you uh, are are in uh, contact with may be interested in doing uh, those of you who are listening to the recording if you click on that link it will also take you to the um, to the survey as well. So in the recording you will see the chat and the link will also be active. The link will also be in the Cody Connects discussion forum as well. Thank you very much folks. Thank you very much for uh, for tuning in today. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Yes, thanks. Bye.